Dear visitors of this first worldwide webinar about facade fire safety. Thank you for watching. We're still waiting for a lot of people who are still uh, logging in. Uh, now passing 100 uh, people who are watching and we're expecting about uh, 400 people uh, uh, watching this webinar. So thank you very much uh, to join us. Um, I'm Leo Oosterveen, director of Brandveilig Bouwen Nederland, uh, a Dutch-based uh, passive fire organization, and together with the Netherlands Standardization Organization and the SFPE, we organize this webinar, um, which, which derives from a, a series of seminars that we held in the Netherlands uh, last year, which were based on a risk assessment tool that has been made by the Netherlands government. What we found is that there is a lot of interest in um, scientific knowledge exchange about fa facade fire safety. And uh, well, this is a, a subject that can easily be transferred worldwide because uh, scientific knowledge, uh, the, the physics is uh, on this planet all, almost everywhere the same with respect. But OK, you can discuss that also, but we're going to do that. Um, so I'm glad that we have uh, people from yeah, really all over the world, from, from China, Australia, Canada, uh, Zambia, Greece, uh, to name a few of the countries uh, that we have uh, attendance uh, from. So um, uh, again, all welcome. Um, and of, of course, uh, the organization and presenters are also worldwide uh, and we'll, our, our chair will introduce them shortly. Uh, the goal of this webinar is to uh, contribute to uh, more fire safe facades and more and then more fire safe buildings of course and to do that we work on uh, exchange of knowledge, exchange of ideas, exchange of insights and experiences and test experiences and modeling experiences so there's a really a lot of to do um, that we can exchange um, and of course uh, we will do this in a uh, respectful manner uh, and uh, with respect for the ideas of uh, other people just um, uh, yes, what i really want to stress yes. Sometimes social media uh, has some exaggerated things which we don't want to uh, come across here. Um, we found uh, uh, some scientists, and not some, probably the most renowned in the world, uh, uh, here to, to uh, discuss uh, with you all these uh, matters. And, um, Angus Law, Sven Eekhout, Eric Guillaume and Lars Borstroom are here in the call and they're waiting they're eager to uh, tell you a, a, a story. So um, if your colleagues has not lo logged in yet, uh, please let them do it. Um, and of course, there's an opportunity for you to post uh, questions, um, which will be moderated by uh, a Case Bot, Roy Weghorst, myself, and we get a message meet. Um, to the left of your screen, you'll find a question mark. If you uh, click on that, you can in, uh, put your name in there and then uh, ask a question. You can also do it anonymously, but we prefer if you if we know whose question we're answering. Um, maybe we are not able to answer all the questions during the webinar. Uh, we'll pick out the, the most intriguing uh, questions. Um, uh, but uh, afterwards, in a week, we'll send you the complete results of all the uh, questions that has been, have been uh, asked. Uh, we may not be able to answer all of them, but we'll do our best. Um, so again, uh, a webinar aimed at learning and uh, sharing insights. Um, 
And uh, yeah, of course, we, we've been, we're very lucky to find someone who is really able and eager to lead us through all the information exchange. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud uh, to introduce to you uh, our chair for today, uh, Birgitte Messerschmidt. So I give the floor to Birgitte Messerschmidt. Thank you very thank much, you very Leo. Much. And thank and you to the organizers, NEN, BBN, SFPE, for arranging this webinar and giving me this opportunity to chair this. Wow, that was that was almost an, an, an alphabet soup there with, with the uh, arrangers. So a little bit about myself, as they already said, my name is Birgitta Messersmet and I am working as the Applied Research Director at NFPA over in the United States. And for those of you that know me, you know that facade fire safety is a topic that I've been passionate about for many years. And I would say even before it was the mainstream topic in the fire safety community. As more and more fires happened around the world with rapid flame spread up the facade, it became obvious to, to most of us that we had a problem on our hands that existing codes, regulations and test methods were not dealing with in an effective way. But despite the facade fires were happening in increasing numbers and in many countries around the world, there was significant reluctance to make any changes to existing regulatory systems. Even a research report from NFPA's Research Foundation on fire hazards of exterior wall assemblies published in 2014 was not enough to inspire changes. Then Grenfell happened and research on facade fire safety got turbocharged not just in England, but all over the world. It was true that it was a shock we all needed to get pushed to do even more. But it is sad that it took a tragedy to inspire action when the warning signs had been there for a while before. But we cannot let fire victims die in vain. We need to learn from tragedies, both the big and the small ones, and we also need to learn from the successes so we can do better as we move forward. The best way we in the fire safety community can honor the victims of Grenfell and other facade fires is to continue to improve our understanding of these fires and use this knowledge to ensure that facades are fire safe. This is why I'm so excited about today's webinar because it's a great event for exactly this purpose and I'm happy to be sharing this. We will be hearing about learnings of high rise facade fires developments in large scale facade testing, the use of modeling for facade fires and the role of regulators and enforcers in maintaining a level of safety. So we're hitting on all the important topics for us to be able to solve this problem down the road. Now we have a great lineup of speakers for you today, so, so I'm not going to talk much more. They are the ones, they are the stars of the show today. So, so let's kick it off. And first up, we have Dr. Angus Law, who is a Chartered Fire Safety Engineer and Lecturer in Fire Safety Engineering at the University of Edinburgh. He obtained his doctorate in 2010 and subsequently worked as a Fire Safety Engineer for Arup UK. In 2014, Angus moved to Australia where he co-founded the Fire Safety Engineering Degree Programme at the University of Queensland. At the University of Edinburgh, Angus' current research activities relate to the fire safety of cladding, engineered timber buildings, and societal aspects of regulation. His contributions on these topics have been recognized with the Institution of Structural Engineers Oscar Faber Medal and the Institution of Civil Engineers Annual Health and Safety Award. Angus currently teaches structural fire safety and professional, professional ethics to undergraduate students at the University of Edinburgh. I hereby give the floor to Angus. Thank you very much, uh, Brigitte, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to uh, speak uh, here today. Um, so uh, I've, I've got a presentation here that is uh, will hopefully be of, of some interest to you, and I've, I've called the, the title slightly different from the, the, the one in the programme. The one in the programme was very long, so I thought I would shorten it down a little bit. Um, 
And so I've asked the question, uh, when, when is a test uh, fit for purpose? Um, and to do that, because obviously we're, we're talking about fire safety and we're talking about facades here, but as Leo said, you know, we're here to tell a bit of a story and I wanted to tell you a story about a, a totally uh, different discipline um, so we can think about these uh, these issues without necessarily looking uh, uh, with all of our pre preconceived notions about fire safety and then we can then draw a few parallels uh, with fire safety and fire safety and facades uh, specifically. Um, I think there'll be some time for questions at the end so uh, please uh, file them into the chat box and and those can get asked uh, as later. So the discipline that I wanted to look at, the, 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 the kind of change of topic that I wanted to immediately make is to look at the aircraft industry. Uh, this is obviously the, uh, the, the miracle on the Hudson, so the airliner that came down on, in, in the Hudson River. Um, and it did so because it was hit by, uh, it was hit by birds. It was uh, the victim of a bird strike. Um, I think it was some geese. Um, and of course it knocked out both of the engines and, they, uh, uh, and, and it then uh, did a, a water landing. Um, in the Hudson. So the question of uh, bird strike is one that, of course, the designers of aircraft are well aware of uh, and they're, they're very worried about. And so there's a lot of thought goes into how do we actually make our uh, planes uh, adequately safe? How do we make sure that the engines are going to keep on run running? What are we going to do? Uh, and a, a few years ago, there was a paper written by a guy called John Downer, who is a social scientist, um, and he analyzed this whole thing. So th this first part of the presentation, I should stress, is not my work. This is his work. I'm just telling you uh, about what he can find so we can think about it uh, in terms of fire safety. The paper that he wrote um, was, uh, was called When the Chick Hits the Fan. Um, and the reason it was called that is because the way that people test jet engines to, uh, to see if they're going to survive a bird strike is by taking, uh, taking a chicken, uh, mounting it into a cannon, turning the engine on, and then firing the chicken uh, into the, uh, the gaping mouth uh, of the jet engine and seeing what happens um, is, is the process that they follow. Um, now, if you don't believe me, uh, we can have a look here. There's a video uh, of, of somebody doing this. Hopefully this will work on the, uh, on the audio. It's not very long. An engine, when it's operating on an aircraft, takes in a lot of air. It can also take in anything else in the environment, such as a bird. So we're required for the FAA to shoot bird carcasses into the engine and to show that we can continue to sustain operation even after taking in the bird carcasses. So there we go. We love a good, we love a good hyperbolic um, documentary. Um, so when they were starting to think about this, they started to say, well, OK, how are we going to test? There's lots of different kinds of sizes of birds that might affect our engines. How are we going to figure out if our engines are safe? And they decided to design this test. Um, but there was immediately a bit of a problem because it turns out it's not just uh, it's not just birds that get sucked into jet engines. All kinds of, of animals actually get sucked into jet engines because when the, the plane is going along the target uh, along the uh, along the tarmac, um, the uh, all sorts of things can be sucked in uh, for, from the runway and from the airfield. So you can have bats sucked in. You can have poor little bunnies or uh, mice. You can have tortoises and armadillos. This is an American uh, report that it was drawing on. You can have much larger creatures such as alligators or, uh, or deer, these kind of things. Uh, and indeed, you can go as far as to have the poor little, poor little possum there. We, apparently, we have some Australian, uh, Australian uh, guests at this seminar, so put that in there uh, for them. So the question is immediately raised. What well, how do we design a test that's going to uh, be OK? We can't surely fire all of these things into, into our, our engines. So we have to start making choices. And so the first choice is, well, we're not going to design, we're not going to check whether or not our plane resists bird strike by going up in a plane and flying it around hunting for birds and, and seeing if we can get them, because that doesn't seem like a very good idea. So the first sort of choice, or if you like, the first compromise that is made is we say, well, we're going to take our engine and we're going to bolt it to the floor. Um, and we're going to rev it up when it's already bolted to the floor because that way we don't need to fly around. Uh, so that's kind of the first choice uh, that is made. Um, and then we need to make a decision about what it is that we're going to fire, uh, fire into this engine. So we have to start thinking about the bird. Um, and as I said, there's lots of different kinds of birds. So we need to make a decision. We need to decide how heavy 
uh, is the bird uh, going to be? Uh, is it going to be a big bird? Is it a little bird? What is it going to be? What is it, what is an appropriate size of bird to test our jet engine? We need to decide what species is it going to be. Different species of bird have different characteristics. Some of them might be, you know, fatter. Some of them might have more bone. All sorts of different things to consider. So this all sounds a little bit strange, but this is a genuine press release from an American Airlines uh, flight after there was a lot of damage to the engine. They, they, they justified the damage on the basis that the cormorant, which was sucked into the engine, is a chunkier, meatier, and has more bones than a looser, watery bird. Uh, and would have, once ingested by the engine, would have a harder time getting through the fans of the turbine. And it's a genuine uh, uh, quote um, from American Airlines. So these are these are kind of things that people were worried about and people start thinking about. And so they say, well, you know, we can take a chicken and we can use that as, say, an, an average size bird. But actually, the problem with chickens is that chickens are, you know, they, they're unique, right? Lots of different kinds of chickens. There's lots of different uh, in, individual birds might be a little bit different. So maybe what we should do is we should standardize the chicken. And so what they created was a standardized bird. And so essentially a gelatinous ball uh, that had the kind of mass and the density and the consistency of the average chicken, uh, which they could then shoot into the jet engine. So again, uh, to, to kind of create that standardization to make sure it was repeatable, because otherwise people might be saying, well, that test wasn't fair. You fired a different kind of bird at my engine. I want it to be the same kind uh, in order to make sure it's fair between different tests. So these are the kind of compromises that start to get introduced when we start to try and design a test. Uh, we, we start to get a bit of a conflict between, well, if we want it to be purely realistic, then I have to go hunting birds flying around in a plane, and well, that's not gonna work. So I immediately say it's not gonna be perfectly realistic, and instead we're gonna shoot the bird. Then I have to make the decision on the bird, and then we can argue about what kind of bird, and eventually we wind up on a standardized bird that in fact isn't a bird at all, but at least is gonna give us a level of repeatability, okay? So that's just the bird. Then we have to think about the engine itself, right? So then we take the engine. Well, there's lots of questions. So how fast should the engine be going? Well, it's not going fast because it's bolted to the ground, but, but we can shoot the bird at a different speed, right? So what, what velocity do we need to shoot the bird at in order to be representative? So we have to start making decisions there as well. So how fast should it go? What color should the engine be? Does that have an impact? Do we need to paint the, uh, the engine a different color in order to make it, uh, in order to make sure that we've checked all the different permutations? These are the kind of questions that can start get to asked. And then finally, uh, incidentally, the answer to that was they, they, they put it to maximum revs uh, and they shot it at the, uh, the, the speed that would be just after takeoff. So when the, it's in the most critical phase of the flight, very much like the Miracle on Hudson. Then the final question we need to answer is once we've got our agreement on our bird and we've decided how fast it, uh, the, the, uh, that we're going to shoot that bird, then we need to decide, well, what is a pass criteria and what is a fail criteria? Uh, and so they came up with something, I think it was uh, not losing more than 25% of power uh, for the five minutes after the, the bird strike and to um, uh, and obviously not to lose integrity to, to, to keep on uh, running. Uh, and so those are the kind of criteria that people uh, people came up with. Um, and so there's a few important points that we can kind of draw for, from this. Um, the first is that a test cannot represent reality. If a test represents reality, then it's not a test, it's just real. Um, like our scenario about going hunting for, for the birds. Um, so it's no longer a test. A test cannot represent reality. But importantly, there's a trade-off here. There's a trade-off between how real our test is. We can't be totally real, but we can try and approach reality versus how repeatable it is. So we can take a relatively real scenario, which would be just to take any random bird that I find and shoot it into my uh, shoot it into my engine, but that's not very repeatable. So we don't like that. So we go for a more repeatable scenario with the, the standardized bird, but actually uh, then what we've done is we've made our test less realistic. And so we have a trade-off here between uh, how real our test is and how repeatable our test is. So a test cannot be completely real and completely repeatable. It's just not possible. And it's important to say this is, this is a fundamental property of any test we might hope to design. It's like, you know, like water has density and 
this is a property of a test. Uh, it cannot be totally real and totally repeatable. We have to compromise between those things and the test designers have to make the decisions about where they're going to place that compromise. So that's my uh, uh, little um, uh, sort of uh, furry off to some, uh, uh, some other discipline to see what they do. Um, but it, it leads to this question of why do we feel safe when we fly? This test is patently absurd, right? You know, we're shooting a chicken at an engine uh, that's strapped to the ground. I, I, it's, 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 it's patently absurd. Um, so why do we feel safe when we fly? Well, maybe you don't. That's the first one. Maybe you, maybe you have a fear of flying. Well, you know, fine. But many people do, or at least many people did until March, feel safe when they fly. But now they feel unsafe for different reasons, I would suggest. Nothing to do with the chickens. Um, so the reason we feel safe is because what the designers of the aircraft do is they they, gener they have this test, which they know is not real uh, and has some level of repeatability, and they have real performance over here. And what they do is they link the test to reality using their knowledge. OK, so they have some uh, understanding and knowledge of the relevant parameters to be able to say, well, for me uh, as the designer, the results from that test are good enough for me to make a leap and to say that they are applicable to reality. There's another reason as well, which is the airline industry collects data constantly about the performance of their, of their engines. So they're constantly getting feedback about what happens in actual bird strikes. Uh, and they're able to actually start understanding, well, how did it perform compared to the test? And they're able to combine all of that stuff to get, come up with a fairly high level of confidence uh, about their test results. So they're able to link the test to reality using their knowledge. So I, I started by asking the question, uh, when is a test fit for purpose? Um, and so my, my answer is that a test is fit for purpose when we can credibly link the result of the test to real life performance. And if we cannot credibly do that, then the test is not fit for purpose. So it's important. You have to believe in the link between the test and reality. And for us to believe, there has to be consensus. Uh, in a community that this is a credible thing to do. So let's make the jump now. Let's go back to fire safety. Um, I've talked about chickens and jet engines, which is a subject I don't know very much about for too long. And let's go back to fire safety and look at the facade, look at cladding systems. So this is what cladding systems used to look like. They used to be made of brick or stone or these kind of things, uh, if we go back a, a long time. Uh, and there were, people still wanted to make sure they were safe, and so they came up with tests. This is a, happens to be an Australian test. This is an extract from the La Crosse report um, where they did a, a small scale test on the, the bits of the facade and they, they dropped it into the, the, the tube furnace there. Um, and so that is, does not look like a building. That is not a, a representative test of how the facade is going to perform in a real building. So. Uh, but it's probably quite repeatable. Um, so we have some, what we need, if it doesn't look like the building, it's a small scale test that is repeatable, we're able to somehow link from the small scale, that very non-representative test, all the way to real building performance. And we do that with the knowledge. So we have enough confidence in our understanding of what the results of that particular very small scale test mean that we can say something about how those products are going to perform on the real building. And that's that's what we have there, a small scale test. Now, the problem happened in, the, I guess, the 1970s, 1960s, 70s, maybe the 80s, with the introduction of a lot more complex building materials, materials that were uh, more flammable into, into buildings and these kind of things. And so suddenly people started to recognize, and there's a paper by Brabowskis where he talks about this, they recognize that, well, we no longer have the knowledge to credibly link the small scale test to reality. We can't do it anymore. Uh, I, there's, there's no way to do it. And so the question then becomes, well, how do we create a new consensus about how to make this leap? And so that's where we start to talk about what we're going to see for a lot in the rest of this um, seminar today uh, is the large scale test. Uh, and so uh, at least in the UK, which is, of course, uh, mostly in my context, it started back in the 1980s with uh, large scale tests at the Cardington Laboratory. Uh, and it culminated in the production of uh, uh, kind of the test method that we now know uh, as the BS8414 uh, test. 
Um, and essentially what we were doing there is we were saying, well, we can't make the leap from this very small scale, very unrepresentative test to reality. It's too hard. We don't have the knowledge. So we need to make a test that is closer to reality uh, so we can credibly make that leap. And the only way we could do that is to go the, the large scale. So we create the large scale test. It's still not totally real, but it's closer to reality than where we, st where we started, what we were using the small scale test for. And of course, if we look around Europe, if we look around the world, we can see all sorts of different uh, uh, test methods. This is a report that uh, Lars, who is, a, is the next speaker, uh, was involved with, with drafting. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a shopping list of all of, the, all of the different test methods from around Europe. And of course, each of them are different. Each of them have their peculiarities, but each of them are also the same. And when I say they're the same, I mean they're trying to do a similar thing, which is get closer to reality. Uh, they're not trying to be that tiny little small scale test. They're trying to come close to reality so we can make a claim about how the test results might relate to what a building, what a real building uh, will do. But of course, there's lots of kind of uh, criticisms here. And, and this is the kind of thing that, you know, people say on, uh, you know, the the, the standards committees and all of these kind of uh, things and lots of discussion here and I'm sure we'll see hear about this later on and um, people say specifically you know about the 8414 well you know it doesn't look like a real building um, it doesn't have windows so you know it's not sufficiently representative they might say well the, the test rig is not tall enough you need to make it taller uh, actually the fire isn't very realistic it's not a real fire that doesn't look doesn't look really right uh, and they might people might say well it's too it's it's too windy or they might say well it's not windy enough you need to incorporate the effect of wind they might say well it doesn't have the little details around the windows that we need uh, that are representative on the on the real building they might say the acceptance criteria should be higher they should be lower they should be more of them these kind of things uh, people would say that the time of the test it might should be maybe it should be longer maybe it should be shorter but there's opinions out there uh, people say the fire isn't big enough, it should have a wing wall, it shouldn't have a wing wall, uh, the extinction should be better controlled. A whole shopping list of, of, of issues, of questions about, about this, this kind of test method. And of course, each of these criticisms um, are, are absolutely valid. Um, what is important, though, is whether or not we can make the link from the test to, to the reality. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, and it's worth saying then that in the UK at least uh, the, the, then a further step takes place is people create this idea of the desktop study so they take the test result uh, and then they use that test result and they they maybe change something about the proposed system and then they write a report to say okay well you know this is this is uh, valid uh, that the changes wouldn't affect the results of the test uh, and of course then that that desktop study is making a claim about how that system would perform in the real world. Uh, so we're going a slight step further away uh, again. Now, I work with a colleague, one of my co uh, co-authors on this, uh, this work is a guy called uh, Graham Spinardi, who's a social scientist. Um, and one of the things to say about this is, is all of these kind of discussions are happening, but for people who don't, if you like, uh, uh, talk that talk, or who are maybe talking so far outside of the consensus, um, they can sometimes be perceived as a little bit mad. Um, that's what they said, that, that, that you're risking, if you, if you challenge the consensus, you're risking the diagnosis of madness. Um, and you can only uh, really challenge that convention uh, for very, very good reasons um, or, or at extreme peril, which is the diagnosis of madness. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, I think what I mean is this. Um, so here's a picture of me in October 2019. Uh, I think, I mean, many people still call me eccentric, so this is something I have to live with, but if I walked around with my mask in October 2019, people would definitely think I was eccentric. Come to October 2020, totally normal. Indeed, it's expected. So I haven't changed. I was still wearing my mask then, I'm still wearing my mask now, but the world has changed around me, and now what was once perceived as strange is now perceived as totally normal. Uh, and so things can change. Uh, around uh, around people, which then leads to them being perceived in a different way. And of course, the event that uh, Birgitta mentioned in her introduction that changed everything uh, in the UK uh, is the Grenfell Tower fire. Uh, a very good reason to challenge the status quo and to think more carefully about these things. And of course, what that does is that has an immediate impact on this, this way that we've constructed how we make claims 
from the test all the way to the real world. So first of all, people start to realize, well, hold on a second. The reason we created the April 1-4 test in the first place, the reason we do the large scale testing is because we don't know enough to make the link from to, to from small scale to reality. So how can we know enough to do a desktop study? So people immediately challenge that as a route to making a claim about the uh, about the about the performance in the real world. Then we have all of these questions, all of these questions that maybe used to be asked within the community now get asked you know, on the uh, in very you know big forums in uh, national media, people asking all of these questions, which of course are legitimate questions uh, to be asking about uh, about tests. And it turns out we often don't quite have the answers to know which of these we should be worried about or which we shouldn't be. So what we have then is uh, the removal of that knowledge about the large scale test. And so we're no longer then able to make a claim at all about real building performance, either based on the large scale test or on desktop studies. And, and of course, this is the point of some discussion, but if you look at you know, insurers, they're very nervous about people doing these kind of activities. Um, can we really make a claim about what's gonna happen on a real building based on this large scale test? And we can see this starting to come out a little bit uh, in the literature. The literature always takes a little while to catch up um, with, with, the, with the practice, but you can see this is a recent paper in, in fire technology, and it highlights some of these issues. So. It, they're saying it's unclear how the fire safety of the occupants behind the facade system can be uh, ensured. Um, there's criticisms of this test. And what this means is that there's no longer consensus about this, these testing methods. Uh, and if we don't have the consensus, then that's a real problem because we can no longer start credibly making those, making those links. Further, if we start looking at the way that these things are being talked about and, and we go into the details of the paper, we can see the criticism. So the, the criticism here is that the, the test protocol is far from reproducible. Well, yeah, I guess it may be far from reproducible, but then we've had to compromise on the reproducibility of the test in order to get something that is, repre is, is quite representative. But then we're now questioning how re representative it really is. And then in, in the same paper, there's also the criticism that the, the tests are not sufficiently representative um, of facades on buildings uh, in the UK. So we have both criticisms uh, sitting there sitting there together. It's not reproducible and it's not representative, or it's not sufficiently either uh, of those things. And I think this is where, and I know this is an international seminar, uh, and I have a tremendously English accent despite my Scottish name, uh, we, we, we can learn from Boris, or maybe we can't. We cannot have our cake and eat it on this one. We cannot have a test that is going to be uh, completely real and completely repeatable. We can't have our cake and eat it. The testing will not allow it. So we're left with this question. How do we make the link from a large scale test, if that's what we want to do, to the real building performance. And we're going to hear a lot about this, I think, over the over the course of the next uh, uh, free talks. Um, but I would, I'd offer this up, is that the credibility problem is not with the test. The credibility problem is with the people applying the test results. Because actually, the test is what the test is. It's always going to be a compromise of some description. It's how it's used and the belief of those people and how they're using it that is that is producing the issues. So, so how do we reclaim this credibility? Uh, and how can we build consensus that this is an appropriate thing to do? And so, again, we're going to hear about the, the, the European approaches uh, shortly, uh, and we're going to hear, I guess, about how difficult it is to build those consensuses uh, uh, with you know, lots of people in the room. But one approach is to get everyone together and, and to talk about and to, and to thrash through the issues until out, out of that comes something that the community has agreed uh, is, is credible. Now, of course, in, in the case of the UK, that, that is subject again to additional scrutiny because of the, you know, the, highly, uh, the very high profile nature of these issues. Um, but that's one approach to rebuilding consensus is just to agree, I guess, that we, we think this is OK. Um, I would offer uh, 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 another uh, approach to this. And of course, this is where uh, those of you who know me would accuse me of buttering my own bread, um, is that we, we, we can take a few different approaches for this. We need education of, of engineers to be able to credibly put the pieces together and to credibly build cases as on physics as to why a test might be, or how we can make a claim about a test 
and how it impacts on reality. We need also the education of the regulators. There's no good uh, the engineers having all the whiz bang knowledge. If the regulators can't understand it, they're unable to interrogate that. So it's very important that we have that dual education that, that is going together. Then, of course, the core of this, the reason we have these tests in the first place is there's missing knowledge. Um, so we need to be able to make that link um, from, from the test to reality. And there's going to be knowledge gaps that we can find and we can plug uh, in order to help those educated engineers and regulators to do that in, in a credible way. And the, the final thing is to, is to reflect then on the example that I had at the very start. Um, and so what do we think in terms of the airline industry and how they perform? Well, data. We need data. And there's, I think there's two kinds of data here that are potentially uh, of use for us. The first is data from, from tests um, that can be used to support something physical. So one of the criticisms, as I said, about these tests is the performance criteria and all of these things. Well, often they're not really very physical performance criteria. If we can start to link the test results, or at least the measurements that we make in tests to, to physical processes that are going to actually control what's going on, then we can start to say uh, more, at least those, those engineers and regulators can start to make more confidence about making the leap from test to reality. And the final thing uh, is data from practice. Um, so real fires that are systematically investigated, and I don't just mean the ones that went wrong, I mean the ones that went right uh, as well. Because um, that's what the airline industry do. They have all of this data. They understand they have a feedback loop that means they can test their assumptions about how their test is performing compared to reality. So that is, uh, I think, or everything I had uh, to say uh, today. Um, I think there is, uh, I think there is time uh, for questions, but I just wanted to thank um, the people who I, I speak to a lot about this kind of stuff. So Rory Han, Luke Bisbee and, and Graham Spinardi, who are all kind of uh, involved at some level uh, in these in these ideas. So I guess with that, I'm going to hand back to uh, to Birgitta, um to see if we've got any any uh, budding questions that need to be asked. Thank you very, Thank you much, very much, Angus. Angus. We got an got echo it. again. All right, okay. so there's time for questions uh, to Angus. We haven't received any questions directly. Oh, actually, uh, we're starting to see some questions coming through here. But while, while I look those through, Angus, I'm going to start with a quick question uh, for you. Uh, at the Facade Fire seminar in Paris last year, uh, there was a discussion around that we do need the test from data, uh, but we tended to only see the test from six, uh, the, the data from successful tests. How about the, uh, getting data from the test that were not successful to to help inform us? What what is your view on that? And over to Angus. Thanks, Birgitta. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Of course, uh, the, the more data we have available, the more we know, um, then the better we are able to put, put, join these dots together. Um, for me, it's it's not just about volume of data, though. Um, I mean, maybe somebody with a very clever uh, um, AI algorithm can take all of the test, test data and, and make predictions about what's going to happen um, based on uh, uh, some you know, magical computer technology. But from my point of view, it's about the quality of that data and it's about being able to link that data back to the physical processes that are controlling uh, that are controlling fire spread within within these kind of systems. So that I guess, um, you know, yes, the more the more data, the better. Um, and, you know, uh, absolutely see things that go wrong as well as things go right, because then we understand when things are going right, how 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 right is it compared to something that's going wrong? You know, um, without that, we don't have a we don't have a frame of reference. Thank you very much. And we got a question here in, in, in the Q, Q and A. Um, would you say that you would also need a level of trust between engineers and regulators? To this day, I don't think there is really a level playing field, also knowledge wise, which causes distrust. Go ahead, Angus. Absolutely. Um, and I think that the, the issue of trust is central to the issue of credibility. If you're not trustworthy, then you're not credible. Um, and so I think that what we've seen, certainly in the UK, um, and you know others can talk about Europe, is is the uh, this process uh, and the 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 sudden scrutiny that it's subject to has has led to the total uh, 
um, if you like, the total obliteration of trust um, between, uh, well, between I would say pretty much everyone within the <laughs> within the kind of um, com different communities here. Um, why, you know, why would residents trust the engineers to 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 do the to do the job? All, all of these kind of questions are very valid questions. And so, really, for me, this issue, this question of regaining credibility, is uh, very closely linked to regaining trust. Um, if 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 we can't you know, trust professionals to be doing this properly if we can't trust them to be educated and have uh, knowledge of the, the claims that they're making about reality, then we're not credible as a discipline. And so that's that's really the, the concern is that, uh, you know, a, as a as an industry, as a discipline, we, we lack credibility. Um, and, you know, I think that many would argue that we deserve at this point to lack credibility. All right, we have time for one more question, and it actually continues in the same track. Uh, is, are there any requirements slash quality criteria in the UK for the consultants to do a desktop study? Any accreditation? Uh, so I think uh, the answer to that inevitably is going to be yes and no. Um, so I think that uh, Immediately following Grenfell, the, the, the MHCLG, the government department that looks after these issues here, I, I think was recognised that this was, a, this was a major problem and that people had been doing, for want of a better word, incredible, uh, not credible desktop study uh, work that was self-evidently not credible and those people should not have been doing so. Uh, at that point, they, 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 they made a little list of you know, professional uh, people who, who a professional bodies uh, affiliation with which would, uh, in their opinion, allow you to undertake a, a desktop study. That said, uh, there's nothing formal followed that. Uh, there's no legal uh, requirement, as there is in some jurisdictions, um, uh, for you know professionally registered engineers to be undertaking such work. Um, all, and and that has been the subject of a lot of uh, a very intense debate uh, here in in the last uh, kind of two years. Um, and so it it it's at this stage it's still a little bit unclear to me the degree to which government intends to make that mandatory. Um, I think it might not be have the full force of law, but at this stage they're proposing it's a recommendation. So quite where that leads it, I'm not sure. Um, so it's a yes and no answer to that one. Thank you very much, Angus. And thank you very much for the great presentation, though I must say that that uh, I didn't used to be scared of flying, uh, except for when COVID arrived. But uh, now I will consider flying to places where the birds are not bigger than chickens, uh, because otherwise I'm, I'm afraid what's going to happen. But let's move on in the program. We are going to continue talking about facade testing. So our next speaker is Lars Bostrom. Lars has worked at RISE, which was previously known as SP, since 1991 in different positions and at different departments. He went into the field of fire in 1999 when he got a position as manager for the fire resistance department. At present, he is working as research and business developer at the Department of Fire Technology. Lars is currently also leading the project funded by EC, European Commission, on the development of the new approach on assessing the fire performance of facades. I hereby give the floor to Lars. Thank you very much, Pegita. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, Angus, for a very good introduction to the difficult topic that I'm going to talk about now. And uh, that is about the development of a, of a test methodology for assessing facades and the fire performance of facades. Let's see now. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the current situation in Europe. Uh, and especially regarding them, the large-scale uh, fire testing of facades. And uh, then I will talk a bit about the European harmonization and why do we need uh, some, something like a harmonization. Uh, and as you might know, we are now in the development of an assessment method for the fire performance of facades. And uh, I'm going to say a few words about that and the time plan we have. And uh, what is more needed? Uh, what uh, R&D needs uh, do we see in front of us? Because uh, it will not be finalized by the development of a, a test method and a classification system. So I will uh, end my speech uh, with some, uh, 
some words about the needs we can see right now that we have to solve in the future. But if we start with the current situation in Europe, and uh, when we're talking about facades, yeah, first of all, we don't know really what is a facade. There is no common uh, definition of a, of a facade. Uh, and here starts the problem that we're dealing with. In some countries, we're looking on the outer skin of a building, just the outer layers. In other countries, we're talking about the, the full external wall. And uh, if we're going to develop some technique to, to assess uh, the facades, we need to know what parts are we going to assess? Is it the whole external wall or is it the, just the outer skin? Uh, and this can be seen then in uh, the regulations that we have in the member states. Uh, we, we see that all member states, they have some kind of regulations uh, regarding the fire performance of facades. So we have regulations in, in place, but they vary quite uh, a lot. Uh, most countries, and I would say, I think all member states in, in Europe have some kind of requirements related to the, the reaction to fire and the Euro class. But then we also have a number of member states that also have requirements or at least re are referring to some kind of large-scale facade fire test in their regulation. So here we have a, quite a large spread in Europe on, when we look on the regulations. If we then go and have a look on the, on the countries where they're using large uh, test uh, methods, we can see that in Europe we have 12 different test methods that are used at present. 12 different test methods. And of course, uh, this is uh, complicated to, to try then to, to get all member states to, to unite on some single method to use in all countries. But uh, when, when we start looking on these uh, different methods, we can see that to some extent they are very similar, all of them. It's, a, it's some kind of uh, uh, vertical surface, a surface where you put a fire below it and see if you get some fire spread on it. Uh, this size is is a little bit different between the countries, but in principle, the principle is the same. And uh, why do we need a European harmonization? I would say we're not talking so much about fire safety here. I would say that it is more about uh, enabling the industry to, to, to sell their products. It's, the CE marking is a system to enable the producers to sell their systems in all member states. So they do not need to, to test it in every country. They do not uh, have to get type approvals in every country. It is enough that you get a, an approval in one country and then you can sell it on the whole market. So the European harmonization, it's mainly to get this C marking and make it possible to, to trade the, with the products in, in, a, a, in a good way in Europe. But we can see also that uh, there are some possibilities here when we start talking about development of a, a new test method that maybe we can improve the test methodology a little bit from what we have uh, at present. Maybe we can uh, introduce some new measurements. May, they do not have to be mandatory, but uh, perhaps we can get some more data from, from these uh, new test methods to be used in fire safety engineering. And uh, I think we will learn a little bit more, build up the knowledge a bit more uh, now when we start looking on this uh, process of uh, getting a harmonized test method. And, and see what what are the 
knowledge in the different member states that have been using their national test uh, methods and how can we combine this in a, in a good way to come up with something that is hopefully a little bit better than we have used in the past. So in the work now uh, regarding the harmonization, the European harmonization, we are looking on getting a, a standardized method to do the tests. But that is not uh, the only thing. We are also looking for a, a method with which we can classify the, the systems that have been tested, because we need also a classification system. Uh, we can see that in Europe, we are not using exactly the same requirements. Uh, for example, uh, in some countries, they are regulating against falling parts uh, from, from facades during a fire, which is not the case in all member states. So then we need a system where you can classify it a little bit different depending on what requirements you have in the individual member states. So we need a classification system that is acceptable by all member states in, in Europe. We also need uh, some kind of uh, assessment method for the field of application. Uh, we, we would like to move for, away from these desktop studies and, uh, and get something that is uh, more harmonized and we know that it is done more similarly from, from case to case. So the field of application is a very important task. So, in order to move forward with the harmonization, a project was uh, launched by the European Commission in, uh, in 2016. And the aim of that uh, project was to, to, to develop a, a test method, or at least a starting point for a test method and a classification system. And it was said that it should be based on the British test method and the German test method. So that was fixed from the Commission. It was decided by the Commission that uh, this is the starting point. We are starting with the British and the German methods and use those two methods and try to come up with a new test method that is based on these two. And uh, we worked on that for two years. And in uh, 2018, we presented the result to the to the Commission and uh, we had two proposals then. One proposal where you were supposed to use the British and the German methods in principle as they are at present and no, no big changes to them, but uh, then a classification system that could be used by using these two test methods. So then we, in that case, you ended up with two different test methods and, this, and a classification system. But we also proposed an alternative method where we merged these two test methods into one test method, where you can apply either a large fire exposure, similar to that used in the British method, or a medium fire exposure, as that you're using in the German method. So then you had one test method, but you could use two different uh, fire scenarios in it and a classification system. And uh, it was a voting uh, for, uh, by the member states uh, in 2019, and they decided to continue the work with this alternative method where we have one test method. And uh, the commission then uh, launched a new project that was started in February this year. Uh, and the aim of that project is to fine tune now this uh, test method. Uh, this figure, it is difficult to, to read what it says, but it shows the principle of the test method. So you have one main phase uh, with a test specimen and in the lower corner you have a combustion chamber where you have the the fire source. We also have a 
what we call a secondary opening. It is not a real window. So it is not an opening. It's not an open area there. It is uh, where you can have some detailing that, that you can find in the facade system that you have to apply when you have an opening in your facade. We have a return wing as uh, is used in both the British and the German methods. Uh, and the, the, com the difference between the, these two is just the size of the combustion chamber and the amount of fuel that you use uh, when you conduct the test. Otherwise, they are similar. So what we are working on now, we can say that it's four different tasks. First of all, we want to make a, what we call a theoretical round robin. And that is uh, an exercise where we have invited a number of uh, laboratories to, to read through the assessment method as it looks right now the one that was presented in the previous uh, project to the commission and to give uh, and to answer a number of questions and to do a, a theoretical test, you can say, according to this uh, assessment method. And uh, the aim of this is to see if it is written good enough so the participants uh, interpret it in the same way, if they understand the text in it and if they it's it would be possible to, to carry out the test uh, in accordance with the, this assessment method. So that was is one task and that has been carried out. And I will come back to the results from that one. Then we have another task uh, where we have a number of tests that needs to be done and a literary review. And it is like uh, Angus said previously, there are a number of questions that uh, can affect repeatability, uh, reproducibility and so on. And we want to get the method that is as good as possible that we can come to. And uh, therefore we need some tests to, to, to see what effect different uh, parameters have and uh, make choices so we can re get a, as good repeatability as possible with, with this test method. Then after that is done, uh, we're going to perform also an experimental round robin where we're going to test this method and see whether we get good enough repeatability and uh, reproducibility, if the method is robust enough. And we also want to check that the, the failure criteria that will be established, that they are approximately at the same level as we have had in, in the previous methods, in, in the national method, in the German method and in the British method. So we do not want to end up with a method that is much more severe or it is uh, less safe. So we will end up at approximately the same level that has been used uh, with the German and the British methods in the past. Another very important task is uh, the, yeah, we can say administration and communication. Uh, if we're going to be successful, then we have to uh, ensure that the, the member states and the industry, that uh, they are, are, are with us and uh, agree with us that this is uh, something that we can live with, that this is a method that is robust enough and good enough to get the confidence. So we are working a lot with the, the communication with the different stakeholders and uh, the regulators and so on. So that is also an important task. But if we look a little bit on, uh, on the status of the project so far, uh, as I said, we have performed this theoretical round robin. And, uh, the aim is to, to, to see whether the, the method is written good enough. Is it clear enough so they understand how to perform a test in accordance with this uh, assessment method? And we had 29 
participants in this exercise and uh, they had to answer it was uh, 52 questions and some of the questions were divided into sub questions so it was uh, over 200 questions and uh, the participants were given six weeks to to do this exercise and uh, it was done uh, uh, in june and uh, the content was a number of questions on different topics. It was some general questions on the test method. Uh, they were also, uh, they should also set up two different tests based on two realistic facades to see how they would set up a test. Well, if they get a question from a client to, to make a test on a realistic facade system. They were supposed to analyze uh, some test data and they make a classification and also write the field of, applica field of application based on this. And uh, they were also, it was also open to give some free comments on the assessment method. And from this exercise, we could see that there were some topics that needs to be clarified much more in detail. We had one important area was the configuration of the test specimen around the edges of the openings and that is both uh, how to configure a test specimen at the combustion chamber and at this secondary opening and this must be more precisely described uh, and uh, explained in the in the assessment method there were also a number of questions regarding uh, the facade to floor junction, which, uh, which is an optional test uh, that has been introduced. It is used in France and Hungary today, and therefore it has also been introduced in this method. But that were, was also a difficult topic for the participants of the, this theoretical round robin. Another important uh, question we could see was the positioning of thermocouples which we believed should be quite simple because uh, we thought that it was very clearly described in the assessment method but we could see from the answers that uh, it has not been interpreted in the same way so that must also be more pre precisely described and then there were a number of questions regarding the field of application and in addition to this, we got uh, approximately 12, 12 pages of free comments from the participants. And that was comments on, on everything from how to, <coughs> to drill through the test specimen to fasten the thermocouples to uh, how to <coughs> build up the test rig. And uh, yeah, it was a number of very, very valuable practical questions that we have that we hadn't foreseen in our work. Then we're going to continue and it is in progress right now, the, the test program. And first out is what we call the wood creep tests. And those tests are, uh, carry, are carried out now in, in France at Effectis. But then we are, after that has been done, then we will look on uh, some uh, fire exposure tests to calibrate the, the method with the Dean and British methods. Uh, we have to develop a method for determining falling parts. And uh, since we also have a requirement on burning falling parts, uh, and that is parts that falls down and continues to burn when they have fallen down. Uh, it is important that we ensure that the fire from the combustion chamber does not ignite material that falls down and therefore we're talking about an uplift of the test rig so we avoid eventual um, radiation from the combustion chamber down to the floor where the falling parts are landing another important question is the environmental conditions uh, mainly wind speed Today, tests are carried out both indoors and outdoors. And if we're going to be able to perform tests outdoors, we have to ensure that uh, we get good enough repeatability. And outdoors, we always have a problem with wind. And do we have to have a 
criteria on which is the maximum wind to apply to a test. Uh, a question also is the position of this secondary opening, which will be uh, looked into more detail through some experiments. And then finally, we have the experimental round robin. And the, in the experimental round robin, yeah, the aim there is to validate the test methodology. Uh, so it is not uh, like a conventional round robin where you look on different laboratories and how they perform the test. Now we are only looking on the, the test methodology. So we are only looking on the repeatability and reproducibility of the test method. And uh, another aim of this experimental round robin is also to, to sample all the data to, so we can calibrate the method uh, and, the fa and establish failure criteria so we get uh, something that is similar to the current ones that are used in the British and the German methods. And in this experimental round robin, we will look on some different uh, facade systems. And it will be a rain screen system where we look on fire spread on the surface of the of, of the facade and also possibly in a, in a cavity if we, it will be a rain screen with a cavity. We will look on an ethics system where we will uh, examine the fire, fire spread on the surface. We will have a ventilated wood facade where we get the fire spread uh, on the surface and in the cavity in the, in the ventilation. Uh, and there we'll also uh, see eventual effects of the secondary opening. And we will also make tests on an inert facade where we do not get any fire spread on the, on the facade. But here we get a good tool to calibrate the repeatability and reproducibility of the heat exposure. And the time plan, it is a very uh, we have a very short time to carry out all this. So we can say that uh, yeah, the theoretical round robin it has already been done and it has been um, published. Uh, we will now uh, update the assessment method uh, with the knowledge we got from this uh, theoretical round robin. The wood creeps test they are carried out right now and uh, they are supposed to be finalized in the end of October. And uh, after that, we, we know what kind of wood crib we are going to use in the, in the following test series. So the initial test that we're talking about, the, both the medium heat exposure and the large heat exposure, they will be done now in the end of the year. And hopefully we'll, we will have all the data in December or early January next year. And after all these tests have been done, then we can make the we will make the decisions on the test specimens for the experimental round robin, and we hope that we can make those decisions in in the end of this year or beginning of next year. Then we're coming to the field of application, and that is uh, what kind of changes can you can you do? when you have performed a test, or if you have performed more than one test, then we are talking about the extended field of application. And of course, uh, as you know, when we do a test, the, the test specimen that we're using uh, when we carry out the test, it doesn't look at all like the facade that you will produce in, in real life. So you must be able to make changes from that that has been tested. And uh, Otherwise, it is of no value to, to carry out this test because you will never build a facade exactly as the one that you tested. So you must be able to do some changes to, to what you have tested. And uh, therefore, the field of application is very important. In our project that we're working with now, uh, we it will be very limited that we are looking on the field of application. 
and uh, there are many details that needs to be covered. Uh, and as you know, there are many different types of facade systems that has to be possible to test and assessed. And uh, in order to get this uh, in place, I, it it is uh, quite a large task to be to be done. And uh, we know there is some uh, work that has been done in UK, but that is very conservative. And it is only for uh, for some kinds of facade system, and it doesn't cover all types of facade systems. And uh, in order to to make this field of application, we have to have some evidence to to show that you can do these changes, that they are safe to do. It is not uh, just to to guess. You we need evidence. So, and uh, we can say right now that the. Uh, a lot of evidence is lacking, so we have to build up our knowledge base quite uh, quite a lot before we can get a, a field of application that is practical for, for the future. So with that, I would like to thank for this, uh, the opportunity to say something about this uh, development of the new test method in Europe, and uh, I leave the word over to Begitte. Thank you very much, Lars, for this presentation and updating us on what's going on with the European test methods. Now, we've had several questions coming in here in, in the, in the Q&A, and, and I'll start with the easy one. What was the reason the British-German test should be the basis for a new European test? Go ahead, Lars. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question really, but uh, it may be because of uh, some historical work. There was a, a project uh, that was carried out within the organization IOTA a number of years ago, where they um, started to look on the harmonization of a test method for, uh, for assessing facades. And that work was based mainly on the British and the German method. So that could, that might be the starting point why it was chosen to go forward with the British and, and the German method. And we can say also that uh, both the British and the German methods, I, I think those are the methods in Europe that are most frequently used. And uh, that could also be a reason why those have been chosen. But in the end, uh, we can see that the difference between uh, the, uh, the methods that are used in Europe, it is not so big. So um, the, the, the fire source is approximately the same. The heat exposure is approximately the same. You have either you have the smaller fire or you have the large fire. I hope this was to some extent an answer. I, I think that that is as much of an answer as, as, as you can give at this point. Um, so thank you, Lars. That was I, I was teasing you. That was not an easy question. So the next the next one, we've had a few questions around this. Um, it, it's around the point that when you do CE marking, it's for the product, it's for components of a facade system and not for the entire facade system. So how can we encourage you know, producers to do these large scale tests if they actually cannot use it to do CE marking of the individual components? Uh, would this be through CE marking of facade kits? You know, what, what, would be, what would be the incentive then for manufacturers to, to do these kind of tests if it's not something that helps them bring the product to the market? Go ahead, Lars. Uh, that was also a difficult question. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're correct. When we're talking about facades, then we're talking about the system. And uh, quite often it is not one producer that produces the whole facade system. It is a number of uh, producers that are producing uh, specific details that are used in the, in, in the system. So, uh, yeah, it is a difficult thing, and uh, 
I don't know uh, how much it will be used for uh, CE marking in the future. I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, we can see the, the same situation uh, to some extent when we're talking about fire resistance. We can see we have a lot of fire resistance standards and classification of different systems. You, you can take uh, walls and floors and so on. But uh, we have very limited of uh, harmonized product standards uh, in this field. And uh, I, I think that is mainly because it is not one producer that is producing the system. It is a number of producers and therefore it is a kit and it is difficult to to say who is going to be responsible for the CE marking of this kit. So um, we will see in the, in the future uh, what will happen, but we, we know also that uh, maybe it will be more that uh, you have to prove in some way that the system to be used on, on certain types of buildings that they have gone through a test at least that you, you can live on some test reports, which is the case I think in many countries uh, already today, and that you do not have a certification, but uh, you have some kind of proof through testing that uh, your system is good enough. So to you, Birgitte. Thank, thank you, Lars. Yeah, that, that there was uh, actually a, a question. I'm not going to ask it to you because I think maybe Eric will, will touch upon it uh, a little bit. Uh, um, but there, there was a comment around that, well, maybe what we need is more of the um, fundamental research into material properties that could lead to design principles and, and thereby give designers more tools uh, when, when looking at the different classified products and how to combine them into a system. So, uh, but but don't worry, I'm not going to ask you, there was no question in that, it was more of a comment and I think it's a good comment to set us uh, uh, on our way into the next presentation, which is by Dr. Eric Guillaume, who works in fire science and since 1998 and is presently the general manager of Effectus France. He is a fire expert involved in various missions, including laboratory development, teaching, standardization, and regulation, fire toxicity, and modeling behavior of materials. In the field of fire safety, he is the author of more than 40 scientific publications, 15 book chapters, and more than 150 conference acts. He is technical advisor for fire safety for many French authorities, and active in standardization as chairman of the standardization committee ISO TC92 subcommittee 3 dealing with fire threats to people and the environment and ISO TC61 subcommittee 4 working group 2 dealing with smoke opacity and corrosive corrosivity for plastics. I hereby give the floor to Eric. Thank you Birgit. Do you hear me? Okay. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody uh, for the uh, organization of that. And uh, I'm very sorry, but I'm sick. So, uh, hopefully, uh, viruses don't pass uh, through the webinar. But uh, uh, I will try to do my best in the, with the, uh, uh, the flu plus, uh, plus the French accent in English. It will be a challenge. Sorry. <laughs> So uh, my topic of today is uh, dealing about modding facade fire and uh, what are the la latest developments of that. And first of all, uh, we have to give a little bit more context on all of that before. And you will see it's very, very linked to the uh, previous uh, speakers uh, because uh, all uh, is exactly uh, in the same way. We have to consider what, why we have such kind of facade. Why well, we have facade fire nowadays? And the question is, what is the scenario of facade fire? Because it, it, it's very easy to say, okay, uh, remove all combustible materials or remove all uh, materials on the facade, just put mass only, and that's all. But there's not only uh, fire safety concerns, there are also uh, energy concerns in the building nowadays. So we have to improve the uh, uh, thermal behavior of our buildings. Uh, I give you just some examples here. Nowadays, uh, building sector represents 40% of the total energy used in European Union. And so because of the uh, 
climate change and other uh, context, uh, decarbonization of uh, construction and so on, we need to insulate better our buildings. The question is how and how to do that in safety. So uh, at the, at the, we have also the context of a slow renewal of uh, the building stock. So it means that we have also to find uh, solutions of insulation for innovation and so on. And this is very often also solution of ins insulation by the external. So first we have a need to increase the thermal performance of the building. We have several technical solutions. We could deal with uh, internal insulation, double walls, ventilated facades, attics, and many other uh, innovative systems. We have also the problem, I will say the problem of the architect. It's not really a problem, but the architect wants to make a building that is special for him. So he, he wants to develop something with, uh, which is very often unique. And uh, we have to combine all uh, acoustics, thermics, fire safety, and so on in a uh, building that will be probably unique. So we have less and less series of buildings. We have uh, uh, each building is a prototype today. And uh, we have also uh, new challenges. So we have uh, nowadays uh, biosourced insulins, for example. We have decorative uh, elements on balconies. We have uh, tall wood buildings. So we have all these things that have to be considered. We cannot consider just the facade as just a facade that is tested, just a wall. It's a little bit more complex than just a wall. So what are all these consequences against fire? We have an increase of uh, thickness of insulence. It modifies also uh, how firefighters work. It modifies the fire scenarios. So uh, it's very important to deal with fire scenarios. I will go deeper in that. And what is the facade in terms of, say, of fire safety? So it's exactly the question you had with Lars uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, is it an assembly of materials, which are all perhaps earmarked for a European context? Is it a construction product, marked, perhaps for kits, but facades are not kits? Or very few of them could be kits? Is it a constructive system, a part of the building? So do you have to make an assessment to make circulation of a model of facade, or do you have to make an assessment case by case, building by building, project by project? This is very important because probably all of that is needed. This is also very, very sensitive to some details. So uh, we spoke a little bit with details, but facade is not just an insulant and a rain screen. It's mounting and fixing, and every screw could have a role in the global behavior, every small element. So you have just a picture of what we do when you mount a facade in, a, in the laboratory for a facade test, and you see the complexity of, a, of what is a fa model facade for uh, for the laboratory, so it's really not evident. There are also other threads, so uh, we have more and more new materials, new constructive systems, and we have to consider all of that to be able to face fire safety. We have to think about fire scenarios. This is the most important because the test, it's a model of a given reality. It's what uh, Angus said, it's what Lars said. We have several scenarios that exist from uh, uh, facade fires. It could be a fire from external building, aggressing another one. It could be a fire behind the building, a car or a trash container, things like that. It could be fire propagating on the surface of the facade, or it could be a fire inside the building, uh, going uh, by the inside or by the outside and uh, going uh, level to level. So, uh, uh, Lars mentioned, for example, the importance in some cases of the connection between facade and uh, slab. It may be important for some system, it may be less important for some other constructive systems, and so on. So all these scenarios have to be in mind of the engineer because the engineer uses different tools. He, modeling is one of these tools. Large scale test is one of these tools, but they are not unique. and. Uh, the most important tool we have is the brain of the engineer. So we have to have qualified engineer to be able to understand the risk analysis 
the projects and the uh, how to pass from a test result from a description of materials to a project that is safe in the end. So we could uh, make this link between construction products that are individually tested, for example, the insulin, the cladding and so on, constructive system that is tested in a certain degree in a laboratory in large scale, and project by project assessment. It could be the desktop studies that was mentioned by Angus. There are also other models in some other countries in Europe, but the most important for all of that is a continuity of knowledge and uh, uh, thinking that we we play with fire if we do wrong things. So we have to take a lot of care of uh, how to make this assessment step by step in a confidence. So where is placed modeling in the assessment? Sorry, I think I. Uh, sorry, I have just a technical problem. So I just have to restart the PowerPoint. Is it back? Yes, OK. So the place of modeling in the compliance, what we deal is with compliance building by building, is somewhere for between the large scale test and the assessment of a given project. So we have to combine large scale test, assessment protocol and responsibilities for that, and on-site expertise. The modeling is not more or less than uh, all the tools that we have, like historical data. So I know that there were questions about uh, if we have a new method, do we have to lose the old methods and so on? No, no, they are knowledge. They give knowledge of all of that. We have also other tools that give knowledge, for example, intermediate scale tests. They don't replace large scale tests, but they could give indication on some singularities or some effect of changes without need to test uh, full scale each time. And modeling is also a tool for that. But these are tools, only tools. It means that to use properly the tools, we have to have a good engineer with a good brain. We have to understand what happens. We have to understand risk analysis of facade. And we could define in that way direct and extended applications. So uh, this is probably uh, what is missing partially uh, nowadays. Uh, as for example, Angus presented, this is what was a little bit lost in UK because uh, uh, they had a problem in the understanding of what happened in the uh, quality of the desktop studies. And in the end, they don't do any more uh, any desktop studies, they just test. So, but uh, the test is a model, it's not the reality, it's not a project. So uh, I think in the end, what we have to make is we have a responsibility, a societal responsibility to give a project that is safe. So what could we do with model? Here it's an example of uh, C plus D. So C plus D is, uh, uh, is used in France and in Japan and in many other countries. It's uh, uh, the vertical plus the horizontal distance to make a uh, flame deflection. And here it's an example of uh, what the model gives as answer to assess the different length of uh, uh, architectural projections, so uh, from uh, uh, prolongation of slab to something that is more like balcony. And we could study with a model what is the optimum situation, and it's not necessarily the longer one, because uh, if you see on the uh, 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 right uh, bottom, you have uh, overheat inside the balcony because uh, you have accumulation of heat in this situation. So it's not necessarily the most ideal situation, but it gives you an idea how the, the uh, model could be used to define, for example, some uh, architectural details of a given project. 
I take another uh, example of use of model in uh, facade fire safety. This is a project that is uh, in the uh, Emirates. This is uh, Luxile Towers. And you have architectural forms. I don't know if the term is exactly the right one in English, but uh, it's a term from the arch architect, so uh, I will not change it. And the problem is that the facades are not vertical. And in that case, it has an effect in flame deflection and also in the test. So we had to use a model to define a test that was representative of the end application. So it's not only a classification of the materials that are in the facade, it's really a classification, a test designed for a given project. So you have details of these storms and how it will deflect the flames. And we selected by the calculation most relevant condition that allowed us to select the uh, proper test to assess the safety of that, considering the uh, most severe flame deflection in this case. So it means that we defined the test using the model. Here, this is another uh, use of uh, modeling for uh, facade uh, fire safety assessment. So here it's wood cladding. We use uh, first uh, 18 millimeter wood cladding with a cavity barrier at uh, 2 meter 8. And we use uh, the uh, intermediate scale model, which is ISO 13785 part 1. Uh, we supplemented it with uh, it release rate measurement and we validate a model to compare to the experiment, to be able to uh, validate after several points like uh, changes in the cavity barriers, uh, changes in the uh, uh, air gap thickness, things like that. So you have an example of calibration of the model. So it's very visual, but we, we don't limit the things to visual. We have the flame deflector that is at a given position and we have the validation uh, through the model. Another uh, use is uh, something that we see more and more, which is a decorative perforated steel uh, sheet, so a metal sheet on the uh, facades of uh, open buildings like car parks. And so here we had a car park or we had a series of car parks to study. We had to define uh, an equivalent aerolic behavior to be able to be introduced in the model depending on the porosity of these uh, perforated she steel sheets. And we defined uh, like a library of different conditions of uh, perforations, densities and so on regarding what is in the market. And we defined after the uh, equivalent model that allowed us to calculate the building and to ev evaluate the smoke reentrance through the facade level by level. And so it's uh, commonly used nowadays to study this kind of uh, facade and uh, smoke reentrance in car parks that are not totally well ventilated car parks in this case. They have something that is uh, partially a screen uh, on the facade. Another example is to understand a little bit more the tests. So here, this is the case of the Lepier 2, which is a French test. So uh, Unfortunately, it was not the one that was uh, discussed uh, in, uh, in the initial uh, European program that was presented by Lars, but uh, it's a test that was defined in the 70s to make a project by project assessment. It was the origin of the test and it was for the first curtain facade. We, we derivated this test uh, to study also uh, other conditions like, uh, for example, the uh, uh, constructive systems nowadays, but, uh, but the origin is really a project by project assessment. And uh, what is important for that is that uh, the uh, thickness of the windows, so the thickness of uh, uh, the wall system affects the uh, uh, flame plume on the facade. So we studied that to understand a little bit the effect of the uh, thickness of an ethics on the, fa the flame you have on facade. We studied also, for example, uh, what is the effect of the uh, uh, air cavity on uh, the temperatures inside the cavity. So it gives us a better understanding of the test. And another example is also uh, uh, what the temperature patterns looks like in the different conditions or in different window conditions, for example, 
if the windows are placed uh, at the plane of the facade or at the plane of the masonry, it will matter a little bit. So things like that have been studied in details and it helps us a lot to be able to make the different assessments at this level. First conclusion, what we could do is modeling at design phase. So modeling is just a tool. It's a part of the fire safety engineer toolbox. So it needs really the good uh, education knowledge from this engineer to be used. But as the large scale, as the historical data, as the intermediate scale, it's one of the tools to understand what we are doing to understand how to do the fire safety assessment of the facade. It's not a way of compliance. I hear sometimes people that want to make the compliance using the model. No, no, it's just a tool and the way of compliance is the safety analysis. But we could design specific tests adapted to specific projects, especially if we determine that the risk analysis shows it's important to go so deep. It helps understanding details, selecting the worst cases for the large scale tests, for example, because we have a limited capacity to do large scale tests. It's, it takes time, it takes money, there's a limited number of uh, test benches in Europe, and we cannot test hundreds of uh, different facades per year and per laboratory. So it's uh, uh, important to understand that and to have, a, to have a toolbox to be able to make the better assessment. Uh, also technically and economically. It helps understand the physics of facade fires. And so it allows uh, making extended application on a scientific basis. But the models should be validated for the application cases. I show you, for example, for the uh, perforated steel sheets that we validated the model just to do that. And uh, uh, we had to develop a basis of knowledge to do that. It's not just using the tool. Uh, many of the pictures I uh, presented come from a FDS model, but uh, it's not because you don't know the FDS that you will be able to do that. You have to have a, a, a knowledge database on that. And so the limitations of the modeling tools shall be well known and documented. There's a second part of this presentation, which is all the uses of uh, models for uh, a tool for fire reconstruction, because here the constraints are not the same. They are very, very helpful to understand what happened in, recon in a reconstruction of major uh, fire disasters, and it includes naturally uh, facade fires. The time frame is not the same. We are not in a project of construction, so uh, we have less limitation also in finance and in time and we could apply the state of the art, we could uh, go deeply, so we could do a step-by-step -step analysis that is well detailed. I have chosen uh, the case of uh, Grenfell Fire, but I will go quickly on that. It's not the objective, it's just to understand uh, how it works. Uh, we could apply that on many, many other uh, cases. How we decided to do that is to make a step-by-step -step validation. So we validate a model uh, at a small uh, scale or intermediate scale to understand the thermal properties, the combustion properties, what happens aerolically. Uh, then we increase the size, we go to large scale test, and then we understand what happens at the level of a facade, then of a, a full uh, fire. Fires like Grenfell and fires like we have today are well documented in terms of pictures and so on. Everybody is uh, using his uh, mobile phone to make uh, pictures of that. Uh, the time uh, is, a, is uh, very accurate because it's the time of the uh, uh, phone network nowadays. So uh, it's very easy to have uh, uh, dated uh, pictures and to understand uh, step by step what happens. So uh, it's very useful to compare that with uh, the results of the model and to understand with the model the physics of what is happening. So this is an example of a validation step. So on left you have pictures, on right you have a, a, a model results and this is a case of uh, basically the, the product that was on the facade of Grenfell Tower and uh, very quickly in few minutes we have a fully developed uh, fire that uh, occurs at all the surface of the material and then it decreases quickly. 
It decreases quickly because we burned all the uh, uh, ACM uh, polyethylene that is on the surface, and it means that uh, the material that is driving the fire at this step disappears quickly. These results, what I mentioned, are valid at the scale at what we test, but they are valid for validation of the model. They are not directly extrapolable to other scales. So it's just a kind of comparison that we could have. We validate the model. It gives us also additional information, like the relative contribution of the different materials that cannot be catched experimentally. So we cannot experimentally say, OK, this material is contributing in that proportion. This one is that other. It's impossible. But with a model, we can. We can have also other details, like temperatures in depth and so on, so that are difficult to measure sometimes. Then we make a calculation at the S8414 test and we compare with the experiments. And this is the calculation. In this case, we see a very typical uh, uh, downward propagation that is uh, uh, very characteristic of this kind of materials. And that was visible in the end in the real fire. And we compare with the experimental results of uh, what has been done at BRE at that time. But it's not enough. We had also to go deeper and to understand how the fire was in interaction with uh, the windows. And so we made thermomechanical modeling of the windows to understand how they broke and how the fire could go outside and enter the apartments. Because it's not only a question of, prop of propagation at the surface, it's also a question of penetration in this case. And this penetration is very important if you have not a fire resisting uh, facade. So uh, we dealt with uh, reaction to fire uh, from now, and here we deal with fire resistance and penetration of the fire. Mm -hmm. And so we made the calculation, we made deformation calculation to be able to have a model of window failure. Then we could apply that to uh, the wall model and validate with the uh, facade fire. So this is just an example of uh, what happens in the reconstruction. And how the fire splits at a given time in two directions. So you have a uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise propagation in this case. And uh, the validation of that compared to the observation. So the, uh, uh, the dense uh, dots are uh, observations and uh, the other ones come from the model. And the agreement is very good in this case. So after that, we could go deeper and make a calculation of uh, uh, contribution of uh, different materials, for example, to toxicity and so on, understanding what happens deeply. In general conclusion of all of that, we have modeling tools that are very powerful today, but it's only a tool. It needs case by case validation, so it could exist, it could could be done for each project. It could be done depending on the, the level of uh, accuracy you want to have or the uh, lack of knowledge you have at the beginning. In all cases, this means that it helps engineers to understand the physics of the phenomena, but it doesn't replace his brain. So what is important is to have fire safety engineers that are educated, validated, labeled. I don't know. Uh, uh, the scheme is sometimes different in one country or another. In some countries, you qualify the engineer. In some other, you qualify the, the uh, company. Uh, so there are different schemes. But uh, we have to be sure that uh, uh, there's a process where the people that do that are well qualified. In France, we choose to do that only by the laboratories, meaning that if you have not the experimental knowledge, you have difficulties to make the assessment. It's a choice that our regulator made long time ago, uh, and uh, he is following this choice. Uh, other countries made other choices, so there's no perfect system, but uh, it has some sense. Facades are complex. They are, they are assessed at several levels. So we dealt with products, system, building. Pass fail is not enough. At the first generation of facade tests like Lepier or BS8414, they are just pass fail, but what fits for uh, uh, an individual house is not necessarily the same that what fits with uh, 
very large buildings, so uh, or a tall uh, or tall wood building, for example, where we have other challenges. So we have to think about that. Model is also a very powerful tool at the construction phase for major disasters. And uh, in the future, we will use that more and more to understand uh, uh, what happened and make reconstruction of these sites. So thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm uh, ready. Uh, sorry for the interruption with the technical problem, but I'm ready now to answer to your questions. I hate when I do that. I was muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you, Eric. Uh, what I was saying is I'm deeply impressed with your um, ability to, even though you are sick, uh, fighting a virus, fighting with PowerPoint, etc., you actually managed to do your presentation ahead and, and finish ahead of time. So, so very impressive and, and making my life a lot easier. We got a lot of interesting questions for you. So um, let me start with this one. How do you think we can work to ensure that modeling is properly conducted and evaluated by the authority having jurisdiction? Go ahead, Eric. Yes, this is exactly a very, very good question. And this is a little bit what I wanted to catch uh, with the last words, uh, uh, with the qualification of the engineer. Uh, some institutions, uh, professional institutions, give um, qualification levels of the engineer, and uh, this is uh, used in some countries, but uh, in some others around the world, as I mentioned the example of France, uh, the regulator decided to limit the number of uh, companies, not people, companies that do that, by uh, an agreement that is linked to their experimental capabilities. It means that uh, uh, you can make the assessment, the modeling, everything, if you have agreements that are linked. And in the case of facade, you have to also be agreed in uh, fire resistance and in reaction to fire for tests. So it's a scheme that is very limiting in our market because it limits people that can do that. But at the same time, it means that you cannot make a modeling of facade if you don't see facade burning sometime. In other words. Thank, thank you. So we'll, we'll continue down the row of questions here since you gave us extra time. So here goes one. Thank you. Very nice presentation. How accurate do you think is the model in terms of flame spread and burning behavior, especially when we are talking about composite materials and complex facade systems with many components? Is the model able to predict the interaction between such components? Go ahead, Eric. Yes, the model is able to predict that in a good accuracy if it's, proper, if it's properly validated. Uh, I cannot do that without an experimental basis. It's totally impossible to just make calculation. But if you make, uh, as I shown, uh, for example, for the wood cladding, it was a good example, uh, the combination between experiments and uh, calculation at design phase of a building, you can have a good accuracy that is uh, in the same order of magnitude than the uncertainty in the tests themselves. All right, we have time for one more for you, Eric, and that is how toxicity can be evaluated using the model. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. So uh, this is a very important question because uh, uh, if you have no penetration of smoke uh, from the outside to the inside, you don't care about toxicity. I will say you don't care. It's, uh, it's a little bit obvious, but uh, you don't care about uh, acute toxicity to, to the occupants. But if as soon as you have penetration of smoke to the building, as in the example I shown between uh, the facade and uh, the entrance, it's very important to understand the interactions and the smoke movement, for example, from one direction to the other. In the case of Grenfell, you had this uh, massive fire on the facade that ignited 
the uh, different uh, upholstery inside the building. And so you have different sources of uh, fire and smoke, uh, external and internal. And you have uh, a sharing of that at the level of the windows with penetration of smoke from the outside, with penetration of uh, smoke from the uh, inside, uh, and uh, all is crossing at the window level. So here, CFD tools are very useful to understand the interactions between the different smoke movements and what happens and where the air is coming from. And uh, sometimes you will see in such kind of uh, fires that windows are only, some windows are only used for air entrance, some windows are only used for smoke exhaust, and some windows are in between. And it's very easy with the calculation tool to give uh, track uh, uh, concentrations to see what is the proportion of smoke that comes from one uh, part and from another part. So after dealing with toxicity means also dealing with hypothesis on what are these uh, yields and uh, what are the uh, models of toxicity you use for the assessment. So it's really, uh, uh, there are a lot of hypotheses behind, and so the uncertainty on the result is much larger. So you have to take a lot of uh, care to understand properly the limits of the uh, exercise. And uh, uh, but technically, it's possible to to, to see if uh, uh, smoke comes massively from the outside or from the inside, for example. It gives you good ideas with some limitations. Thank you very much, Eric, for this detailed and fascinating uh, uh, insight into to the, the world of fire modeling for facades. Uh, it's clear that, that we are moving well ahead on, on this area, so um, happy, happy to hear about all the good work. And now it's time for us to, to move to the final speaker. And this is Sven Eichhout. And Sven graduated as an engineer in construction from the Denea Institute in 2001. Since then, he has been working at the Scientific and Technical Center. Ooh, we got some background noise here. <laughs> uh, at the Scientific and Technical Center for the Construction Industry, the BBRI. First within the Technical Advice Department and then as responsible for the formations. But since the start of his career, he has specialized more and more in the field of fire safety. He currently works within the WTCB exclusively on the theme of fire safety as a project manager in acoustics, facades and joinery department. In addition, he is an animator of the fire safety standards and the fire safety TC of the BBRI and is part of various working groups that develop technical information on fire safety. I hereby give the floor to Sven. Go ahead. Thank you, Birgit. Can everybody hear me? I hope. OK, so uh, the previous presenters all talked about the large scale tests and simulations. Now I will try to explain you how the Belgian legislator tries to change the legislations according to all the new modeling uh, that is taking place. So the legislature uh, will require minimum requirements and alternative methods uh, are being defined in our legislation in Belgium. So I will explain the Belgium approach. Here by an overview of the content of my presentations, in first instance, uh, I will briefly explain the complex Belgian reglementation, um, after which I will explain the different risks of fire propagation uh, which are taken into account on the Belgian legislation. So it's fire spread via the surface of the facade cladding, fire spread from one compartment to another, and the new requirements are for fire spread within the facade system itself. Obviously, it's necessary to also declare alternative uh, prescriptions um, possible because um, there are modeling models which are developed, so they must also be able to get used for develop a fire safe building. So as you may know, Belgium uh, is a federal country divided in three regions, uh, the Flemish, the Walloon and the Brussels capital region. 
There are also uh, three communities, uh, the Dutch, French and German speaking community, and they can all draw up fire regulations for the matters for which they are competent. So there are very much uh, regions who can decide uh, which level of fire safety is necessary for some buildings. But the minimum fire safety requirements are laid down at federal level by the Royal Decree Fire Safety. It was published in 94, but since then, of course, there have been various uh, adaptations um, to the legislation. Uh, in general, uh, the fire safety requirements uh, in Belgium uh, apply only uh, for new buildings uh, and they depend on the height of the buildings, what is obviously uh, normal, I think. We distinguish uh, low-rise buildings uh, that are buildings with a height up to 10 meters, uh, mid-rise buildings, uh, a height between 10 and 25 uh, meters, and the high-rise buildings, uh, which are buildings higher than 25 uh, meters. For industrial build buildings, uh, there is a special uh, regulament uh, in Belgium, and for single-family homes, uh, they are not covered by the Royal Decree Fire Safety. So in Belgium are a lot of regions and communities. They can uh, publish uh, standards, uh, but the minimum uh, requirements are defined in the Royal Decree. So the regions can pose regulations for hospitals, schools and other buildings. So it's a little bit difficult for uh, some for the people to sh to follow the regulations, but I will talk about the Royal Decree. So the minimum uh, requirements uh, in Belgium. Um, the revision of the Belgium standards uh, for facades has already started in 2015. So it's well before the catastrophic fire at Grenfell. Uh, the text was approved in 2019 by the High Council uh, for Fire and Explosion Protection. Uh, and now we have finally a government in Belgium uh, after something like 500 days, I think. Uh, but I lost counting uh, meanwhile. It will probably be published in the course of 2021. So, which risks are uh, in the Belgian in the Belgian reg regulations? Uh, there are three routes uh, of fire spread via facades, namely fire spread uh, via the surface uh, of the cladding, fire spread from one compartment to another, outside inside and fire spread within the facade system. And there, there are the new regulations uh, in Belgium. The requirements uh, for the fire spread via the surface of the facade cladding are related to the fire reaction of the cladding. The requirements differ depending of the height of the buildings. So they already told. For industrial buildings, there are no requirements. So the facade uh, can have a reaction to fire uh, of class E or better. Um, for low rise buildings, a class C S3 D1 or D S3 D1 is required depending on the type of user. So it, will, it means the user uh, can be awake and can leave the building on its own. Then, the regular requirements are less strict, uh, but when the, uh, the person needs help to uh, leave the building, think about hospitals, uh, the requirement is of, or will be CS3 D1. For mid-rise buildings, it's BS3 D1. Uh, and for high-rise buildings, a non-combustible cladding with a fire reaction class of A2 S3 D1 is requested. Um, these requirements apply only to the cladding in end used conditions. So you have to take into account the impact of the underlying material layers, such as insulation or eventually the method of fixing the, the facade system. 
Um, here are some examples uh, of the facade cladding in end used conditions. For example, uh, attic systems, uh, the requirements are therefore not only valid for the top coat rendering uh, of the attic system, but they are required for the entire facade system as it was executed. In other words, uh, the rendering with a possible impact of, for example, the insulation material used in Belgium, it's uh, almost 95% uh, of the markets uh, they use uh, EPS uh, insulation. Um, the same for wooden facade cladding. The requirement does not only apply to the tem timber cladding alone, but to the entire system. So the cladding with possible impact of the underlying panel and insulations. But there are there is an exception uh, in Belgium. So if the underlying layers, such as the insulation, should not be taken into account if they are protected uh, by a panel uh, with a fire protection capacity K230 for high rise buildings or K210 for mid rise uh, buildings. So that's uh, how the Belgian, Belgian legislation uh, is regulated for fire spread via the surface of the facade cladding. Um, the second way uh, is the spread from one compartment to another, so explained by the previous uh, speaker. Um, in Belgium, we look, there is a possibility for fire spread via the exterior, via the windows, or via the junction uh, between uh, the floor, the compartment floor and the facade. So there will be uh, requirements uh, for those two components. For the junction uh, between the floor and the facade, uh, the Belgian regulation demands a junction EI 60 minutes. Um, that's to uh, invite the fire spread via the interior, but also via the exterior. Uh, they, there is a facade element necessary uh, for um, E60 minutes, and it has an, a length, a developed length for one meter. So the distance here must always be greater than one meter to avoid that the flames go inside the compartment above. That's fire spread uh, via from one compartment to another, uh, but the new regulation, and that's the most important uh, for uh, today, is a fire spread within the facade system. It was not covered by the previous reglementation in Belgium. So uh, it's all new, uh, but uh, the, the text uh, of uh, the Royal Decree hasn't been published yet, but the fire brigades uh, already use uh, the requirements, uh, the new requirements. So, as I said, it shall be, be published in 2021. Um, so we take into account the ventilated cavity, flammable insulation and so on. Um, how the new regulation uh, has been uh, written, um, all the parties concerned uh, have uh, where fire services, engineering officers, manufacturers, contractors, architects and so on. So the document uh, is really uh, accepted by all uh, the par parties in construction uh, in Belgium. And that was very important uh, for uh, the legislator. So, all the requirements for fire propagation via the cladding system and between compartments remain valid. This table, uh, as projected, is a supplement, is an addition to these requirements. And the new requirements uh, are requirements for substantial components of the facade system. A non-substantial component is a material 
with a mass less than one kilo per meter and a thickness less than one millimeter. For these elements, there are no requirements. For all the other, they have to, um, you have to look into the table of it is the right requirements uh, in the table. Uh, the requirements are, um, uh, excuse me, depend on the height of the building. So we have the high rise, mid rise and low rise buildings. Um, if we look to the low rise buildings, uh, you can see that the classification uh, of the uh, substantial components, such as the insulation, uh, there is a minimal fire reaction class demanded and the class is E. So there are not really uh, specific requirements for the installations for low buildings. Uh, the legislature thinks uh, the risks are very uh, low for buildings uh, up to 10 meters. For mid-rise buildings, so that are buildings um, between 10 and 25 meters of height, um, the essential components, such as the insulation, must have a fire reaction class A2, S3, D0. But if the insulation is completely protected by elements uh, with a K3, 10 or EI, 15, uh, the insulation may have a fire reaction class E or better. So uh, you can also use uh, type solutions by installing fire barriers, and I will come immediately uh, to that. Um, first, completely protected by elements K210, or for high buildings, it's K230. Uh, if you have a wooden uh, structure, um, then you have to put uh, panels inside and outside um, to protect the insulation uh, from the fire from the outside and from a fire from the inside. So it's very important to take this uh, into account. Or with a more traditional uh, wall with brickwork, um, the fire resistance of the brickwork can also be used for to protect the insulation but uh, you have to put special attention to the junction uh, between uh, the masonry and the windows uh, so that the fire can't get into uh, the cavity at that place. So that's uh, in very important. Um, type solutions for mid-rise buildings. So it's always with a fire barrier. Um, the legislation in Belgium uh, takes two type solutions. Facade with air cavity, so a traditional uh, brickwork or cavity walls, uh, and facades without air cavity, uh, attic systems uh, with rendering or bricks. Uh, and the type solutions are like this. Um, the type solutions for uh, mid raised buildings with a ventilated cavity. Uh, there, the Belgian leg legislation uh, wants uh, no, you cannot use combustible insulation, EPS or XPS, and you have to provide an interruption of the air cavity by fire barriers. Uh, the fire barrier, most of, the, most of the, it will be stone wool with a height or minimum 20 centimeters uh, and it um, but you can also use stone wall with an um, intumescent layer so uh, the cavity will be sealed in case of fire uh, that is also permitted uh, for the Belgian legislation uh, the tip solutions for facade systems without an air cavity, the, so the ethics uh, systems, there the uh, insulation can be combustible, so a minimum class E, but there must be an interruption by fire barriers 
always a stone wall uh, every two floors uh, or around uh, the opening of the windows. Uh, for high-rise buildings, for high-rise uh, buildings, the insulation shall be non-combustible and overaction to fire class A2 S3 D0 unless it's fully completely protected by elements K230 or EI30 uh, and the condition of the high-rise building types uh, solution is fulfilled. So uh, you will have to use uh, uncombustible materials or you have to protect all the materials and you have to uh, uh, for the type solution um, you need also a fire barrier that can you see on this uh, figure uh, as an the type solution for tall buildings consists of packing completely the insulation so in these zones, the insulation is uh, protected by elements K230, uh, as well as the inside as the outside. And uh, the elements are interrupted by fire barriers, stone wall, uh, each two levels or around the windows. Um, there are also alternatives to these pres prescriptive requirements. So as the previous speakers uh, already have shown, uh, in Belgium, large scale tests can be used to demonstrate that there are, is no risk uh, of fire spreading uh, through the facade system. Um, in absence of an European test method, but in the future it will be uh, certainly uh, available. Uh, tests are currently accepted uh, according to the British standards, which has been already been shown. Uh, the DIN, uh, the DIN, long, the German uh, test method, or uh, Le Pire Deux, uh, the French method. So, the Belgian legislature, you can also use large scale tests. Uh, the previous speakers uh, have already uh, shown us uh, other large-scale tests from other countries or modeling by fire safety engineering uh, eventually uh, based on small-scale uh, tests so they can also be used in Belgium but uh, you have to uh, demand fair large-scale tests and applicant must be submitted to so you must do a demand by the Commission of Derogation and they will look of the system, your calculation, your modeling uh, is acceptable in Belgium or not. There are a certain fire safety engineering uh, in the Belgian, Belgian legislature. So the perspectives uh, in Belgium, the revision, which will be published soon, I hope, um, there is an evolution towards uh, use of non-combustible material in high-rise uh, buildings, but you can also use large-scale tests to prove that there is no risk of spreading fire through the facade system. For meterized uh, buildings, the combustible installation and, if present, the cavity must be interrupted uh, by a fire barrier. Uh, the type solutions distinguish uh, facades with or without a cavity and for low wire buildings uh, there is a slight tightening of the requirements for fire action of the facade systems in vent used uh, conditions. So that was a little bit how the Belgian, Belgian legislation uh, is now in progress. So it will be, it will taken in account also large scale tests uh, and modeling uh, is possible. So Birgit, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Sven. And this time and I remember to unmute. But I, 
Yeah, and good. Thank you. You muted, so we avoid the echo. So thank you very much, Ben. Very interesting to hear uh, uh, the approach taken uh, by Belgium. It does uh, show some similarities to several other European countries. So, so, so not a lot of surprises there. Um, we have one question come in, which I, I, um, I'm going to read to you. And um, I hope uh, I'm, I'm not full. I think it, it's specific to the Belgium regulation. So I hope that you can answer it because I know I can't. Um, and it says, is fire spread type three applicable when facade high rise is K230 or medium rise K210? You're muted. Oh, sorry. So, um, can you repeat the question, please? <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to see if you can hear. Can you hear me? Good. So, is is fire spread type three applicable when facade high rise is K two thirty or medium rise K two ten? Give it a try, Swen. And if 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 the, you don't have the arm, we can always ask the, the to, for more clarification if need be. But go ahead, Swen, if you have an answer. Uh, for the Belgian legislation, it's possible, yes, to uh, protect all the elements. So the insulation uh, must be protected uh, on all sides, uh, and. For high-rise buildings, it's 30 minutes, K230, but you don't have to, you have to put in mind that uh, for high-rise buildings, uh, you have also all components, um, no, the cladding has to repunt uh, the class A2. So normally that won't pose a problem. I think. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, ha I have a question for you, um, and that is in you, you, you mentioned that for mid rise buildings, the use of fire barriers. Uh, is this both uh, in the case of attic systems, as you showed, uh, and, and also for ventilated uh, facade systems? How, how, and if it is also for ventilated facade systems, how are you testing those fire barriers? Over to you, Sven. So um, it's an interrupting of the insulation and the cavity. Uh, so the stone wall is in contact, uh, is uh, firmly in contact with the masonry. Uh, and there, the, the Belgian legislation uh, thinks it's enough to uh, avoid uh, fire spreading through uh, the cavity. Uh, if you use um, fire barriers with an instrument layer, yeah, there are uh, the British standard tests uh, available. Thank you very much, Sven, both for the presentation and, and the answers to the questions. So we are getting to, to the end of, of our webinar today. It has been four amazing presentations giving us some, some insights to, to where we are on facade fire safety and a lot of learnings. And there's three things that, that I heard, and it's actually the three C's uh, that I'm going to take away from, from the webinar today. The first one was the credibility that Angus was talking about. We need to reclaim the credibility around that we understand that there's a link from performance and test to real life. The other one is complexities. And that is something that every speaker here has, has mentioned. You know, we have the many different scenarios that we have to look at. We have the many different components. And, you know, the, the uh, comment from Eric in his presentation, each building is a prototype. So this is no simple problem to solve. It is highly complex and I think everybody will agree to that even before today. And the last one is a very big one. That is competence. We need engineers with a good brain was Eric's quote. I think it, it's a great quote um, and they need to understand the facade fire performance. It's not, you know, as you've said very well, modeling is just a tool. Testing is just a tool. All of this, if you don't understand the context, then it's really a, a you know, a problem starting to apply this. 
So, so the three C's from today is credibility, complexities and competence. So what all this leads to is that we need research and we need the applied research so we can that can lead us towards the engineering methods, the modeling and to education. There's no doubt that there's more needed in this area and it's great to hear how well we are moving on this, but there's still more for us to do. But there's one area that we haven't really talked about that much today and I can't help but bringing it up here in the end because I want people to think about it. And that is that even if we get to the point that we have the perfect regulation, the perfect modeling, the perfect education of, 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 of engineers, etc., we still have a weak link in all of this, and that is the installation of these systems. So with all the complexities that we have, we still have to consider also the inspection of these during installation and their lifespan, as well as the main maintenance. And we need to think about training the installers in understanding the complexities and how what they do on the construction site can have an impact on people's safety. That, that was the only missing link that I had today. But other than that, I think we've had an absolutely amazing webinar with great presentations. I've been, it, it, you made it so easy for me by being on time for all of your speakers. Thank you so much. And with that, I would like to give the floor to, to Leo. So thank you, Leo, for helping us through this. Go ahead. Thank you, Brigitte, and all the uh, viewers of this uh, webinar. Uh, we had many questions. Uh, we published 27 questions um, and we will assign them to the uh, relevant uh, uh, moderator or uh, speaker so that we can uh, focus on uh, answering them in, in the right manner so that we hopefully in a week can uh, get back to you with uh, answers on, on the questions that has been have been raised. So, uh, some preliminary answers have already been given. So and also some answers were in, uh, maybe given for part in, in the in the sheets. But we're uh, coming back uh, to you. And uh, of course, thank you for the, all the questions and, and um, yeah, your, your listening and your contribution. We had uh, at the highest uh, uh, on one point uh, 240 people in the call uh, and it varied a, a bit um, so we hope uh, that you enjoyed it and that we can can work on uh, an, 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 another uh, follow-up on this uh, if you have any suggestions uh, feel free to uh, give it to our organizations uh, baby uh, and and then we'll email you of course so you can easily react um, so first of all of course the, the view you guys viewer thank you for attending uh, and of course our speakers Angus Law, Sven Eekhout, Lars Borstrum um, and all the others uh, we, <laughs> uh, thank you very much um, and um, Eric Guillaume, of course, and uh, sorry, I've, uh, I was a bit mis mistaken. Um, and of course, uh, I want to thank all the people behind the scenes, which I, ro I wrote them because to make this work, a lot of people were busy. First of all, our, our producer, Desiree Fasa, who really did the switching really great. Uh, and so I thank her very much for this. Uh, Claudia and us for all the uh, for contact with you and all the um, speakers. Marc Berger, uh, Jerome Rutgers and Corrie Bauma. Um, and of course, our moderators, Roy Weghorst and Kees Bot. And um, to give you an overview of who were there in the, in the meeting, we had uh, people from Australia, China, UK, US, India, uh, Greece, Switzerland, France, Zambia, Poland, Belgium, Netherlands and Emirates. So we were truly worldwide and also uh, uh, across many sectors from insurance companies to universities, uh, uh, to uh, fire departments and uh, to local authorities. Uh, so I guess this is yeah, really um, uh, been what we hoped it would be. Um, and for now, uh, I guess for, for us here in the Netherlands, it's uh, almost evening for some people the day is just starting um, 
and uh, well thank you for attending again and we hope to see you and work with you on uh, more fire safe buildings thank you very much <laughs>